Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome for this evening's session. This afternoon, we have here Sangeeta Ma'am and our fathers along with us for the Johnson and the other team members. Welcome to all of them. And as we begin this evening, I would like to welcome one and all who are going to be participant today. This is a rare occasion that we meet together from different corners of Maharashtra, Gujarat, and some of from Goa. It's good to be together online when we cannot be physically together, at least it is God given opportunity for us to connect ourselves online. And I'm sure you will enjoy this session because one who is the resource person, Sangeeta Ma'am, I've been listening to her. She is excellent and very clear, articulate in her substance and in her knowledge. I wish all of you all the best and enjoy this evening's session. Father Johnson, who is with us, is uh, very enthusiastic and very talented person. He is the one who prepared recently a survey for all the schools and for every parent. You can imagine he will be through survey reaching to almost 500 schools and all and every parent of our school. So let us listen to him also along with at the beginning with of this session. Over to Father Johnson. Father Johnson, would you like to share? Not sure whether Father Johnson is able to hear. Father Johnson, can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Father Johnson. Good evening like to, to all. Yeah, please. Thank you. Dear Bishop. Yes. Good evening to all. Yes. I look at this present situation as cocoon stage in the life of a teacher, not quarantine. I'm happy that the whole team, Western Region Catholic Foundation for Education, led by Bishop, is with the teachers of Western Region. In and out the world, something is happening. Maybe a new development or a transformation. Because Today, the society, respectful distance has become a priority and all are focusing on digital expressions for communication. Therefore, we the leaders, we the teachers must upgrade ourselves. If not, we may fail to understand, support and guide a student. This may lead to an identity crisis in the life of a teacher. To keep up our identity as a teacher in this changing scenario, one must follow the signs of the time. Whether we like it or not, change is inevitable. And it will happen because it is the basic theory of nature. So growing up to the Expectations of the present time is the only shortcut in life. We know that humanity from a stone age has traveled itself to, the, to an intellectual age. Though still, psychologists say EQ has 
relevance and importance in this intellectual human society than iq anyway i would strongly recommend every teacher to learn more and more digital language and digital expressions than holding on to our own conventional practices in education system always efficiency is being considered as the criteria of success therefore in order to be an efficient and successful teacher be a technocrat in this new digital world that is what i would recommend all our teachers to face the present situation may god bless you all thank you thank you father johnson uh, appreciate your thoughts and uh, so happy that you are part of the whole effort uh, in ensuring that all our schools are ready uh, to ensure that learning never stops we have father gavin from saint pius uh, high school mulund father gavin welcome yes thank you <laughs> would you like to share your thoughts father gavin yes just a few thoughts uh, first uh, i'd like to um, you know thank um, the western region uh, cfe wrcfe for this wonderful initiative that they have been taking to help us to um, you know to to get all of us to this one platform of uh, online training online learning in this um, lockdown it's extremely difficult for us to reach out to our students in our schools and i feel this is a wonderful initiative taken by the wrcfe to educate us to help us educate our students uh thank you father Eli uh, bishop elias francis joseph and all the members of this team and uh, please continue with this initiative thank you thank you father thank you Uh, so we uh, we uh, as you know that we have almost 500 schools who have registered and we have we have started registering to G Suite and uh, slowly we have started conducting training. We had the first batch of training where Sangeeta Ma'am uh, uh, she conducted a training on Google Meet, uh, but the Google Meet space of even 250 candidates were uh, where where it's a smaller uh, number and our number was much larger. I'll show you the picture of how it was looking. right when ma'am was teaching so you can see all those almost like red dots all across so uh, we felt that uh, you know how can we reach to more and that's why we requested her whether we can do it on youtube this time so that more people can uh, besides having a look but also can come back and refer back uh, one also learning which we did from last time is because the live chat was on right so a lot of people wrote to us that we can't see we can't see the live chat is going on so this time we have disabled that uh, so we are also learning we are also uh, new in technology so we are also learning but this time there's no live chat so you can't wish good morning good afternoons and all those stuff you will just learn here so i would like to welcome sangeeta ma'am uh, to the screen sangeeta ma'am is a very very senior teacher from sanskriti school and a math teacher and that's one area which most of our teachers like to learn more how to actually teach math using google classroom at some point of time we'll definitely come to that but sangeeta ma'am is also a, a certified uh, educator from google an innovator and spent so many number of years uh, working with students and teachers in developing them to use different digital tools so uh, bishop would you like to welcome her formally before we allow her to start conducting the session yes uh, sangeeta ma'am uh, it's a uh, i'm fortunate to know you by this online program and uh, as mr joseph just now told that i have been chipping in at times in your presentations for last two days and i found you a very clear distinct and knowledgeable person in this field for your seniority and being knowing this new technology very comfortably you are talking to the teachers by being born teacher looks more comfortable with the students so also 
you know what are the teachers need and how to explain to them you will remain surely on this youtube for years to come and many more will learn from you it's a god given opportunity to you and i thank god for the gift that which you have and you are making use it making it uh, you are using it for the greater good of many many teachers in our whole western region it's a talent that god has blessed you and when you really give it to others i think you will have greater joy than any anybody can offer you any any gift in the world and this is a greater joy that you are reaching thousands of teachers who are in the same profession as you are so thank you very much for giving your precious time and your talent may god bless you and may he multiply your talents many many fold all the best for this thank session you. we'll enjoy it thank you thank you thank you so much thank you so much sir so thank you so much uh, archbishop and um, francis sir for uh, giving me this platform as uh, you said yes it really is a pleasure to share my learning with thousands of teachers and uh, as you said the recording would remain available and i hope that today's session and further uh, it will help you to all the teachers to get empowered and as uh, it was it was very rightly said you have to change with the times and it is the time that requires us to change i'm pretty confident that uh, under the given circumstances you have already changed you have already started looking for alternatives from the traditional teaching and uh, that is what we are looking for uh, in all the teachers as of today so i hope today's session will take you forward in your journey uh, will open more possibilities for you and as you and your school get ready to bring in gsu for education what uh, we i'm going to talk about today and in tomorrow session will at least let you start on your journey and then of course it is going to be a journey for each one of us some of us will explore on our own some of us will help others to explore and some of us will possibly lead this change so i hope some of you will play some important role in each other's life and will uh, make this happen so i'm going to start with uh, sharing my slides and uh, we will then continue learning more about g suite for education so let's start with sharing the slides okay So Francis sir would you be able to do the needful So are the slides uh, visible now Yes ma'am Yes Uh, yes, it's visible, ma'am. Ah, uh, when I put it in the full screen, I can't see the window. So, Francis, sir, you'll have to just confirm if the slides are visible. Yeah, yeah, it is visible. You, you right. can, you, you were on the right track. Yeah. Right. Thank you. All right. So, what we are here to learn? Let's just uh, get back in place, and I'm going to just get back happening. So. i'm here to share some of my learnings with you as i was introduced i am sangeeta gulati i am head of mathematics department sanskriti school i've been a teacher for 30 years this is my 30th year of teaching i'm quite uh, excited at uh, reaching so far in this journey and uh, over the years i have learned and i have changed with the times and i've kept up with the times so and i have the honor of getting the national ict award in 
And Google Suite for Education is something which I've been working with uh, for a number of years and I have gained certain certifications in that. But besides that, it is the experience and of using something which I enjoy. So along with maths, my other passion is technology. So that is what I think is the reason why I'm here and I'm able to uh, share this journey with you. So what we are looking at to, in today's session is to understand what G Suite for Education is. What does it uh, bring to you when you as an educator and your school adopt this uh, uh, solution? So G Suite for Education is basically a complete package of number of apps that you would be able to access your students will be able to access, which would let you and your students create, collaborate, and also get connected with each other. So when we are looking at the GC for education, what does it entail? What does it bring with it? There are a number of these possible apps that you see here. So you're looking at a possibility of apps. Some of them, some of these icons might be familiar to you. So we are looking at Docs, Google Sheets, Google Slides, Drive, also Jamboard. And these are uh, apps which are very, very suitable for collaboration. So we are going to be looking at what that means and also what kind of a power does these apps have, which you can make use of as an educator. Along with that, we are also looking at two other apps that you might be familiar with, at least the one of them you might be familiar with, and that's a calendar. So we are using Google Calendar for multiple uh, reasons. You are even uh, keeping certain reminders, lining up some events. And Google Keep is another of the apps which is most useful for managing all the tasks. Typically, what it might mean that maybe you want to make a shopping list. So you can start a short note here. So it's kind of a to-do list. And in that, you can start uh, sharing that list with the members of your family. In the current scenario and as an education app, why is this important? Because it can become and start, in fact, to be the small way in which you start curating digital resources. So if you come across a nice website and you think it is something useful for you, you can take the link of that and keep it in the Google Keep note and it can become a resource. You can also share that note with your students and your peers, right? So that is how one look at these two apps to be your partners in this new journey. Also, putting it all together under the G Suite for Education, the flagship that they uh, are looking at as for the LMS, that is Learning Management System, is a Google Classroom. So Google Classroom is a most powerful way to, uh, especially in the current scenario when we are not able to meet our students, this is our virtual 24 by 7 classroom where we will connect with our students, where we will interact with our students, where we will do assignments, where we will share resources, and also we will do assessments. And those assessments, some of them can also be done using Forms. So Google Forms is definitely an app which I call to be my favorite because it helps me assess. It also helps me cut down on my assessment time because you can make quizzes out of it. If they are all multiple choice questions, then they can be self-graded as well. And I think every teacher loves to have that. So you're looking at that as a possibility here. We'll be spending more time on these two apps in tomorrow's session. Today, we are going to be building uh, understanding of other apps that will all work under Google Classroom. Of course, you might be already familiar with Gmail. And Google Meet is what, if you were there in yesterday's session or as it was referred today, Google Meet is uh, an app which has been uh, now made part of the G Suite for Education and is available till the um, school closures are on. And there you can use this as a video conferencing app. Also making sure that uh, the students get some live time, some time where they are actually interacting with you in uh, a face-to-face -face environment. 
Also, advantage of Google Meet is that if you are using it with G Suite for Education, you will be able to record your sessions. You can have 250 participants in that. But the best part is that the recording that we do comes instantly and gets filed very neatly in the Google Drive. With G Suite for Education, the Google Drive plays a great role. And that has unlimited storage. So it does not matter how big the file is. It will automatically process. You don't have to download it. You don't have to worry about how much space is there on your device for that recording to be saved. It gets filed directly and it uh, very neatly gets into a folder most organized. And of course, there is a Hangout chat, which if you want to have a session with your students, just to clear their doubts in a one-to-one -one manner, you can use that. To manage this entire G Suite for Education for educational institutions, whether it is schools or higher education, the Chrome panel, the Chrome admin app, as you look at here, is the most important one. This will be uh, an app which any IT administrator of that institution would use to manage the IDs to manage also the various rights that have to be given to the users. So there is a possibility when you use G Suite for Education to make what is termed as organizational units so that the faculty perhaps is in one group, students are in another, even among the students, you can have juniors in one group and the seniors in the other unit and the different rights can be then applied. Rights could be as simple as whether a particular group or which is known as the organization unit, whether they will be able to access Gmail or not, or whether they'll be able to access YouTube videos or not. So that is uh, the power of this, which all can be done at the back end uh, with the minimal effort. So that is what all comes together under, under this G Suite for Education. So we are going to take a look at some of these in a little deep dive manner as we go along with today's session. Starting with the main app, as I highlighted today to begin with, that is the Google Drive. If you are a beginner in this journey, then you need to get familiar with Google Drive. You need to understand that this is the cloud storage, uh, which will make your life easier. There is no requirement of you creating the content, then downloading it or saving it in a certain pen drive and then carrying it um, from one point to the other. Anything that you create using Google Drive will remain safe. There is no save button, but it remains safe. And also because under the G Suite for Education, it is unlimited storage. It does not matter how much of content you are saving. So every Google app, every Google element or file that is created does not, in fact, occupy any storage. So if you are uploading certain PDFs or you are putting in certain uh, recorded, uh, maybe your own recorded lessons as an MP4 files, they will be absolutely fine and you don't need to worry about the space occupied otherwise. So that is definitely the advantage. But the other advantage is it's like your home Almira, where you have a whole lot of material uh, in terms of maybe your clothes or maybe your books or files uh, with important papers. But unless your Almira is organized, it will become very difficult for you to find something in it. And of course, you will find it because you have kept it there. So there are ways that you can search Google Drive. But it is always helpful to know and to always follow a structure and also maybe use the folders which will categorize your work. So if you are just going to start with a fresh account, you will have an absolutely empty Google Drive. But believe me, in no time, that Google Drive will get very messy, very unorganized, will fill up with material and you will have trouble finding the right thing in the right way. So start in an organized manner and therefore get familiarized with what Google Drive looks like. And of course, to get started with Google Drive, where is this Google Drive, right? Some of you might even have a question like that. If you have never used Gmail, 
or have never used any kind of a cloud storage. So for that, the very simple way is you can type in drive.google.com in the Omnibox. Omnibox is the place where we often put in the various web addresses. Or when you have signed into your Gmail, in this case, when you are signed in with your G Suite for Education ID, as you open your inbox, you will find this nine dots grid. It's also known as the app launcher. It's known as the nine dots grid. And this is where all the apps that we are going to be looking for will lie. So this is the, the moment you click it, you will find various apps and there is Google Drive. So once you click that, then it will open up. If it is absolutely first time, it will be blank. There is nothing in it. But when you open up a Google Drive, then there are various panels or various sections on the left hand side, which would indicate what can happen. So let's try to uh, use this uh, view to understand what kind of an options are there. So you're looking at a possibility of uh, the drive to have my drive. So any file that you create in your Google Drive that will come in my drive. Shared with me is the place where if somebody shares a file with you, it will not show in my drive, but it will come under shared with me. You're also going to be working with some re, uh, documents again and again. So any document that you have used in the last 24 hours will always show under recent. So if you are working on something and you want to look it up, you can just click on recent files and it will immediately pop up. At the same time, you also are looking for search drive. So this little bar here, which is like any Google search, if you remember some keywords about the file that you had created, even if the name of the file is not the word that you remember. So if I type in here so that particular word, for example, if my uh, this presentation is about create and collaborate, connect. So if I just put in maybe here collaborate or connect word, I can using certain keywords, I can search for the file which is corresponding to it. So that is also the power of Google Drive. But what is more interesting is that in the Google Drive, there is this in Google colors, the plus sign with a new return. That is the button which we will always use to start creating something new. And what could that new be? It will be a document or a presentation, could be a sheets, could be a Google form, could be drawings, could be also a Jamboard, could be any app that comes under it or if it is added later to it. So that is what you're looking at getting familiar with Google Drive. Once you've got an idea of that, then idea is uh, to also get familiar with the concept of that, what kind of documents are going to be created. So when we look at each of these icons, which are very nicely categorized and you know distinct in colors, you have the first one, which is for Google Docs. So Google Docs is nothing but a word processor app. It's simply that. Google Sheets is the one in green, which is similar to what you have used as spreadsheets. So you're looking at Google Sheets is doing exactly what you would do for collecting the data, analyzing the data, doing certain tabulation, also maybe drawing certain graphs of that information. And of course, it has many more uh, ways of being used. The third one is Google Slides, which is a presentation app. So presentation app, like the presentation that we are doing right now. But as I go further down, we'll try to showcase that each of these apps by nature were meant to have one purpose, but again, when you start using it in context of education, then there are different ways and interpretations of this, which is what we are going to be exploring today. This one, as I suggested earlier, is for Google Forms, which is definitely going to be your favorite as well. The red one is for Google Drawings, which is again a blank page left open for you and your students to create on. And Jamboard is so far, in fact, it was one of the uh, 
apps which was never highlighted because Jamboard is meant to be a hardware. And it is, was, in fact, so far not even available in India. But the web app of Jamboard is now proving to be almost like a virtual whiteboard on which you can write, you can add images, get collaborative work done, and so on. So all of these have their own purpose. And of course, now with us as educators, you know, we get creative. Uh, even if right now you're feeling a little lost and you are uh, in a state where you are a little confused and you're saying, why am I supposed to use dogs? Why can't I just do what I've been already doing? So that is where you will need to spend a little time in exploring each of these to understand the possibilities that uh, these apps bring to us. So let's start with examining Google Docs. And most of what I'm going to talk about in the next five minutes will be applicable to the other uh, apps as well, because the Docs and Slides and uh, any other of the apps that you've seen, they lend to be a very powerful way of collaboration. So we are looking at an understanding that so far, if you were not using Google uh, apps, then what you were possibly doing were you were creating a certain file because you have been working in more or less semi uh, digital manner. Even if it is say for a question paper, you've created a question paper, you've made a question paper, you've typed the question paper. Now you want to show it to your colleagues. So what do you do? You download that file, then you attach that file to a mail and you send it to your colleague. Then the colleague downloads it, also makes some changes in it and then sends it back to you. Again, as an attachment. And then again, you might have to show it to your supervisor. So you will again download the new version of it and then again make a mail, send it to your supervisor. So in this entire process, you are actually creating multiple versions of the same document and you will have to be very, very careful in naming that file every time you download. Otherwise, you would be left in a quite a mess. And that is where the Google Apps comes in. So when we are looking at the G Suite for Education, it's just going to be one file. Whether it is Google Doc or Slides or even a sheet, it is just one file which you can share with your colleagues, your peers, your seniors, or your students as we are looking at right now. And in this one file, you can now look at how you want the other person to contribute. So in that situation, you are looking at using the various rights that comes with sharing. As the, you open a new Google Doc, it is absolutely blank. There is nothing in it, but there are certain toolbars that open up there. So there's a file menu. So you have file, edit, view, insert, format, etc. You also have something which will always show up there that all changes saved in Drive because there is no save button here. So if you work on it, then the work gets saved in the real time. You can add comments. That means if I have shared this file with my colleague, but I don't want him or her, to make the changes, but suggest the changes, then they can add comments or I can give them the rights of editing. So how does one do that is simply by going into that share button and then you choose what kind of rights you want to do. Do you want to make that document public on the web? That's also a possibility. Anyone with the link or your organization or it is with specific set of people. So you can choose those uh, ways of sharing the file with your colleagues and friends. Once the file is shared, then you can choose what kind of rights you want to give, whether it is can edit, can comment, can view. In fact, uh, it's my bad that this screenshot, in fact, is in for maybe a little older file. There was an update just this week or last week where this sharing uh, box has changed. So if you open now, it might have a different look about it, but the ideas are still the same. Whether you want to share document with someone with an editing rights or can view or can uh, only comment. So if I want to send it to my supervisor and he or she needs to just comment on it, then I'll share only with comment rights. 
if I want them to uh, perhaps edit, then the editing rights. But when you're sharing a question paper at the end, even in a virtual situation right now, if you are going to share it with us uh, as a resource to with a student and you want them to only view, not edit, then obviously you will choose the can. So definitely these uh, possibilities, it's not only unique to Google Docs, the same idea and the same uh, settings need to be considered when you are working with Google presentations, which is Google Slides, or uh, looking at uh, Google Drawings, Google Sheets. Google Forms work a little different. There, the editing rights are not given in this manner, and that is what we will, of course, focus on tomorrow. So that is typically what you need to be aware of before you start using these Google apps. But then the question might again be coming to your mind, how am I going to use it? What are the ways that I can use Google Docs? It's a word processor app, so I can type something into it, or I can maybe ask students to do it, but what else can we do with it? So just to have an understanding of that, uh, there are going to be few uh, examples that I would like to share before we open a Google Doc or a slide in live mode and try to do some work with it. So this is a way I can uh, share right now. You're looking at a possibility of a Google Doc, which is nothing but collection of questions. So you're kind of creating a question bank. So that's also required because you want to share resources with your students. So you create a Google Doc. And if there are two or three teachers teaching the same subject, why not share our work? So you share the doc with your peer colleague teachers and everyone starts adding in the various resources. It could be links. It could be problems that the children should be aware of. Question bank kind of a development can be done. And as the file is getting processed and is getting ready, you can share it. You can share it by publishing it to the web and it will kind of turn into a web page. And you as a teacher will continue working on it. It doesn't have to stop. As in when you come across an interesting question, add it in the file. And in real time, the child will get an updated file as well. And of course, for an interdepartmental work. So if you are developing your curriculum or your lesson plans, you can share those. How can students use it? They can. You can assign a Google Doc to the students and then ask them to maybe make summary of the lesson. Or you can assign questions to the students and they will be able to answer those questions by just typing into them. So how we assign and how we share is what we will again, of course, come back to tomorrow in our Google Classroom session because just sending the link will not be the suitable way. How many students can you keep mailing it to? That's not uh, the very organized or efficient way of doing it. So when we start looking at it, using in terms of how we are going to do it with the students, then that is where the presence of that uh, Google Classroom will make a big, big difference. Sometimes, uh, as, as most of the educators, in fact, not only me, most of the educators are realizing all across the world that when we are taking our teaching from our conventional regular classroom teaching to the digital and remote learning environment. We will have to reinvent our lessons. We will have to revisit the lessons that we've been teaching so far. We have to make sure that the students are engaged. They uh, should feel motivated to do the self-learning. And in that situation, you might have to uh, get a little creative. So I have one example just to show you what I mean by that. So I'm going to look at using Google Documents only. So this is just a Google Doc. And in the Google Doc, there is a possibility for you to insert Google Drawing, the app that we have talked about. And you can then create a certain drag and drop activities. So that is the power of using Google Docs. So if I just open this document for you to see in the live mode what it looks like, then this is the Google Doc. So you just got familiar with the kind of uh, possible uh, menus that it has. So in this Google Doc, 
I've added some content which is based with the purpose that it should become a lesson that the child will learn at his or her own pace. So in this lesson, some information has been added in and a link has been added in for Rene Descartes. So go and study about who uh, came up with the idea of partition system. And some more information for them to explore. So assuming something, they have to now get the position of their desk in the classroom. And then to get the child active into the lesson, the child is prompted to create something. And then they will be able to maybe do some drag and drop activities, which actually bring some life in the lesson. So the moment the child double clicks, open it, it opens into an interactive uh, document, which you will be able to see to be nothing but uh, where the child is able to pull and place the points around. But this is something which the child is able to do in his own environment, not uh, worried about the live session. This is something that you have created, left it with the students again, how? Through Google Classroom, which again will be done tomorrow. And so you have to come back and watch the session tomorrow for that. But the idea here is that these documents is something which each one of you will be able to create. It's not very complicated. Uh, I will try to demonstrate how I've added in this drawing today. And then not only that, children love games. And since they are sitting on a device, why keep them away from that? So if I have come across a nice game which the children can play, but play with a purpose. So this is a game where the children will stock the shells, but they will get coordinates of a point and therefore they have to pick an object and place it at that coordinate. So they can play this game and more. So more as the lesson progresses, the challenge increases, the variety increases. They will also get chance to practice and then do something much more than the textbook level. So topics like which uh, lent to something like this, uh, kind of an activity is a must to explore. Again, being a teacher, I have to be very, very clear and honest with you. Not all the topics are going to lead to this kind of an activity. So do it in the place where it is most suitable. Not because you have a tool, you must use it. You have to find the right place for you to use something like this. So let's get back to the presentation and see what else is possible here. So next, of course, is Google Slides. So when you look at Google Slides, then it is a presentation app. So we can do presentations, which is what I'm doing right now. You can have presentations shared with the students as well. So you can have a deck started and you share that slides with the students uh, and then they can start creating something. You can also have something like this for the younger kids because we are looking at covering uh, all K to 12 years, right? So if I look at drag and drop activities or sequencing activities, they can be very easily made with Google Slides. So let's try to see uh, one of them right now. So if I open up this, uh, it's not going to be exactly read or write word, but an activity where a certain timeline has been created. So you can create this as a teacher for yourself. And uh, this is of course for the tech, but you can change it to any concept that you are teaching. And then provide these objects which the children will have to place at the appropriate point so that it completes the task of what you are looking at as the timeline of a certain concept. Once they do it, again, you as a teacher will be able to assess this because this is going to come back to you through the Google Classroom. It's not that you have just shared the link. And this is an individual activity. So each child will do it for his or her uh, work only. Whereas if I go back to the presentation, then you will be able to see uh, perhaps a collaborative task because collaboration is uh, what makes Google Apps so very strong. So how can you use Google Slides or presentations uh, for collaborative tasks? So this is just one example that you can then 
think about how it will work in your environment and that is by looking at uh, giving them a deck of slides and giving them clear instructions as to what is expected of you this is a very basic example that you will now modify for your needs and we have given them a basic uh, outline of what we want we want child to as they learn about living and non living things which they do in grade 3 in their uh, science evs lessons so they will find images now this is the advantage of having a digital uh, uh, solution with you that they will look for go to insert and they will find an image that suits the conditions given and they will put it in the box that is relevant to it but this deck of slides is now created for 30 students so at on each slide we have marked the number roll number or the just a number which has been given to the student and each child knows the corresponding number that belongs to them and they will work individually on their slides as it goes so this deck of uh, slides is shared with the rights that anyone with the link can edit so that all the 30 children will be able to edit this set of slides and that it's itself is very very important because we do want them to collaborate and therefore they will also learn certain uh, ways in which they need to be good digital citizens so take this kind of a challenge to be an opportunity to tell the students that you will not uh, delete work of other students you will not write or use or work on the slide which is allocated to another student but you can also teach them to maybe take uh, pick one slide or two slides of other students and give some creative and a constructive criticism of that so that they learn to appreciate each other's work at the same time if there is a suggestion that can come from the peers then that is uh, the best way of uh, making children learn and it will give them a variety of uh, possible examples now this is a uh, just one of the suggestions now it is up to you as a teacher to see how it would work for you in your subject so this right now as you see here is based on that uh, fair model where you have a word inserted then you have a historical connection to the unit definition use in a sentence picture for word you can change this to any format you want and or you already are using graphic organizers in your classroom i'm pretty sure that most of us as uh, teachers you know we have uh, these ways of getting children to build up their vocabulary so when you have already a structure that your children are used to following you can turn that into a digital mode using google slides so you will be able to add these elements to the slides the child each child will work on only one word but if there are 30 or more than 30 students in the room then you will get a collective vocabulary built up uh, which can actually cover your entire chapter so as a literature teacher think of the possibilities as a social science teacher think of the possibilities that this can open for you and your students and again why not maths teachers <laughs> right i am a maths teacher i should not forget that so even as a maths teacher how about if i have to insert an image to uh, show their understanding of angles so if they are asked to think about reflex angles they might be able to find images or for the younger kids if you want them to get familiar with perhaps shapes right so you can ask them to look for the shapes around them and if they have access to even a small camera through the phone they can take the images from there and insert or of course they can always google for it which is going to be in the environment of the google slides itself so that is definitely a possibility for you when you are looking at just simply google slides to be your uh, tool to start with and as we said earlier one deck for all so this is an economics example of one of my colleague who uses it in a, a big way to teach the concepts in a collaborative manner going ahead we are looking at my favorite google forms so google forms are uh, basically ad were made as a survey app 
So you are just collecting information. But over the years, especially with G Suite for Education, the feedback that comes from teachers is taken very seriously and they work on it. So teachers wanted to uh, use this Google form for quizzes. And earlier we were using a certain add-on to turn a form into a quiz and assess and so on. But in the last three years, they changed this and they made it to be so more efficient that you can create a quiz out of the regular Google form. And not only that, you can also add more feedback to each question. So the students can see their scores coming in instantly, can get feedback. And a, what a teacher gets is a very nice summary of the responses. You can get a graphical uh, view of that so that you are able to target your lesson, next day's lesson, to meeting the needs of the children. So when we are doing this in remote learning right now, for me, this is the most powerful thing that I'm using in a certain day. So every lesson is accompanied with some self-assessment uh, exercise. So we give them three to four questions every day, sometimes five as well, but not exceeding five, where the child will answer these questions on the same day based on the topic that was taught. And just attempting those four or five questions, although they are all multiple choice, some of them are a regular four marker in our exam as well. But we want them to do it on a piece of paper and just show me the answer so that I can, for the time being, at least get the satisfaction that the children have done some practice, have gone back and looked at the concept. And through the Google Classroom, I'm able to actually see their marks coming in. I'm also able to see who has not submitted. But what a student gets is much more important. So this could be a four mark question. They have only picked an answer. But I might not be very sure whether they have actually attempted it in the right way that I want them to. Because many of our children who are very smart, uh, they can just do it all in their head. But when it comes to writing it, they're not able to put their solutions in the correct way. So how do I ensure that the children get an experience and an exposure to the kind of answer that should be written? So what I would do and you can do is maybe make the solution either as a video or just simply as a text. Of course, the Google form would allow as a link more now. So you can use that image and uh, link it with a Google form as a feedback. So it really is most powerful because it does what you are expected out of the assessment. It assesses, it gives students that instant feedback, which is much more important because they need motivation. And if they don't get those five on five every day, they go back and look up and say, where did they go wrong? And I get the messages from the students. I am not too sure how to do that question number three. So that message is enough for me to start my next day lesson with question number three. And that is only possible because I'm doing every day this kind of an assessment with them. So that is something which you will have to focus on and work on and uh, make sure that you master because this is going to be your partner in the coming months when we are looking at remote teaching, if uh, we continue with that. Google Draw, again, is uh, very interesting. Uh, it is kind of like what you can do with the slides other than, of course, the presentations. But it is a versatile app where you can, again, create graphic organizers, concept maps, again, more of those drag and drop activities. So if I just try to showcase maybe one of them, uh, then you will be able to see the kind of activity that is possible. So here again, it's a kind of a blank page, uh, which usually comes with a transparent background. You can change the background, put some instructions for the students. What do you want them to do in this? And then in this case, they have to complete the life cycle of butterfly. So what the students are going to do is they are going to place these uh, images in the appropriate manner and then and now you can think about how you would use something like this, perhaps, where you just give them a blank page, ask them to maybe create the water cycle, right? And then, or concept map of the topics that are being done. So in this case, there is a requirement that they must connect these with the curved connectors. So what does that mean? Where do they find it? So I can add more instructions here. So click here to learn how to add them. 
So again, the instructions have to be very clear to the student because you are not in front of them, right? So you have to be very, very clear and give them as much information as you can in the terms of what your expectation of the work is. And in case they are coming across something new for the first time, then you have to give them clear instructions for that as well. So for example, here the child has never learned what curve connectors are or where to find them. So uh, again, this might not be something that you can always do or you are always uh, going to master it instantly, but you can create a small GIF for that to say, this is what you want them to do. But where are the curved connectors just for the demonstration? Since it is not a live audience who is working with me, I feel that if I just show, then it is not going to be uh, a complete session. So for today, I'm going to bring in a little bit of these demonstrations as we go along. So this is where the curved connector is. I'll pick the curved connector. As I bring it to an image, uh, there are these purple dots that have uh, got highlighted. Let me see if I can make it a little bigger for everyone to see. So the moment I bring these uh, crosshair um, cursor now, there is these purple dots. So I want to connect this uh, uh, part to the second image. So the moment I bring the cursor there, it gets highlighted again, those purple dots. And I'm going to then connect them together and complete the life cycle of butterfly. So that is uh, typically what you might want. But if you want uh, children to be more creative and you want them to do a little more work, uh, because we want a certain flow as well. So there is an expectation that you should have some arrows. So make some arrows. You can also change the thickness of the line. Uh, you can, of course, when you have digital uh, tools in your hand, then why not use colors? Colors are always, you know, welcome. So you can choose various colors. You can also uh, complete this and nothing goes wrong if there is a uh, extra step that has come in, then just undo and we are good to go. So if I choose this, I can again change the line thickness. I can change the end arrow to be the one and I can choose the colors. So that is definitely something which children would enjoy. But again, why should one do this is to be clear to you. Does it help you to do your concept? Does it help children to learn something uh, which was the purpose of your lesson. That has to be the foremost thought and not because you have learned something new to do. That should not be the motivation behind uh, doing something like this. So that is uh, the way that you, know, you have to look at it because these resources are going to be available in plenty. There are uh, amazing websites and amazing educators all across the world who are creating digital content, putting it on their blogs and websites and creating templates for you to use. So this one, I would like to acknowledge Eric Kurtz is one person who I follow. He's an amazing educator. He creates amazing resources and his uh, website is controlaltachieve.com uh, where you can go and find more templates like these. And you can then tweak them. So this is not the original uh, template. But the idea was available there and then I could reconstruct it so that it becomes more useful for us to uh, use or to showcase. So definitely go ahead and try such resources. Ma'am, would, you you like to, to, ma yeah. would you like to repeat that website again so that uh, the participants yes, can... Absolutely. Sure. Uh, so the website is called controlaltachieve.com or just Google for Eric Kurtz. C U R T S. So when you Google for Eric Kurtz, you will go straight into his Alt um, uh, Control Alt Achieve. So that is a great website for you to follow up with. Okay, so let's uh, move on. As I said at the beginning, Jamboard, uh, for many years, it, uh, in fact, it came in two years back into the drive and we never explored it much, never felt the need to explore it much. But now more and more people are discovering and rediscovering this. So what's Jamboard? 
it's again an app which is lying in your drive, which uh, one possibly had not thought of using it earlier. But it's kind of a whiteboard. I'll just give you a live demo on that. But now teachers are creating. Again, I had to uh, take examples from my colleagues because for maths, we are using it, but for a different purpose, uh, very rarely as well. But we are still using it. But the kind of examples that are coming in from social science, from science, uh, from uh, sociology, this is from one of my colleagues who's uh, doing absolutely extraordinary work. So in this case, we are looking at a possibility that uh, if I open this particular Jamboard, it's basically a white frame whiteboard where you are able to type in text using sticky notes like post-its. So if you want some collaborative work to be done, then you can use those sticky notes and also insert images. You can, uh, I think that's going to take long to open. So I hope this one opens up because they are all now heavy and busy with the images that are there. There it is. So these are post-its. They're simply post-its. So we do all of these exercises in our classroom. We give them post-it notes or we give them worksheets or plain sheets and ask them to collaborate or think. So this is something which uh, can be now done digitally because this Jamboard has number of frames that you can keep adding it. So as you move across through this arrow, you move from one frame to the other. So if you allocate a frame to one particular team, you say, all right, row number one to four will work on frame one. And then row number five to nine will work on the other one. And they are given that uh, discussion is being done in the class. And this was created. Most of them is, are being created while the class is in the meet session. So it is not that they are just doing it uh, later after the class is over. It is during the live session that they are working. Why? Because you cannot always expect children to do everything in an asynchronous manner. And live session doesn't mean that you are only giving lecture. You're also giving them these tasks. So it kind of becomes like what is becoming a very popular term right now is uh, those breakout rooms. So you give them these, you put the link in the Google Classroom and say, okay, go to the Jamboard and this particular team is going to work on frame one and this particular team is going to work on frame five. And then they start putting together uh, what they have learned. So this was on community identity and then each one of them in that team uh, contributed their own bit to it. And this happened in live time. And within five minutes, this concept that was being taught uh, took a more visual form. So the students were able to bring in their understanding of what community identity means to them. And if you want them to write their name, then they can write their names. If you don't want them to write their name. It can remain an anonymous activity. It is completely up to them uh, as to how they use it. So this is definitely something which you as a um, teacher will have to explore and see how uh, you want the students to work and how you want them to take it forward. But otherwise, what Jamboard actually is, is nothing but a blank board. So I'm going to uh, not... Uh, use this directly but i'm going to open a fresh page uh, for it so that i can don't spoil uh, somebody else's work and demonstrate as to what you can uh, do with this kind of a file so let me just go here and add a new file okay so since it's taking a little long to move on i'm going to use this and then delete that work so here, uh, children had work, but what you can use are these tools on the left side. If you are able to uh, see it uh, closely, then this is what it looks like. So on the left side, there is this little pa panel of uh, tools. So you have a pen here. And when you click on the pen, then you get various options of uh, what kind of a pen you want. And there is a marker. There is also a highlighter and there is a brush. You can use either of them to create uh, certain activities depending on what you want. You have an eraser. You also have a select tool. But you also have something called as a sticky note. A sticky note is what is actually helping us. Uh, because with a sticky note, 
it's turning into like uh, post-it notes that we are constantly using uh, to mark or to put certain information together or for certain brainstorming sessions. So if I take the sticky note and I choose to change its color, then I can uh, look at this and you know talk about uh, what we are so this is I'm writing so that I remember what I have to delete later. So I'm looking at this coming in here and I can just click on save and it goes and gets added into the gem. And this is something which the students are doing to amazing level. And of course, you have choice of adding image. So if I want to add an image, I can upload from my own device. I can do a Google search right here. So if I'm able to find a certain image of the concept that I'm talking about. So suppose I'm teaching a certain concept and uh, uh, I want to get an image related to that. So I can possibly uh, look at uh, maybe the national flower uh, and I'm looking at maybe just the lotus, right? So if I just type in lotus here, I'll be able to get various images and student will just have to click and insert. So inserting images is the same as you would do whether it is in the jam or it is in the um, slides or it is in the talk. You can insert, you can then resize them, you can um, give them a different orientation, you can drag and place them. So this is what also is really helping you. But as a teacher, if you wish to use this, then uh, since it has uh, various backgrounds, it has also a chalkboard kind of a background. If you have a touch device, then you might even try to attempt using this as a blackboard. So if I take a pen from here and I want to maybe use white color, then if you have a steady hand and if you are looking at, uh, uh, you know, using it for teaching, then you might even think of using this as a, a jam. So right now I'm just using my touchpad of the uh, device that I'm using. It's not a stylus that I'm using here. But for younger children, suppose I want to just teach simple maths. And I put on my a slide, okay, what is going to be three plus three? Then they might be able to, you can, in the meet session, you are using this and they are uh, putting the answers in the chat. That also is very much a possibility as the case may be. So that is definitely something that you can think about uh, making use in a, a situation where you are looking for something which is more interactive than something which was pre-prepared. So this could be just a blank board and you are ready to use it. So that is what we are looking at as uh, the possibilities with Jamboard. Going ahead, and uh, in fact, this one uh, I couldn't open uh, because it was a very heavy file, so I didn't want to take chance. But this has been made beautifully where the entire lesson has been summarized by the class. And they chose to, uh, you know, the creativity of students is something to be appreciated. I went for a post-it which has color like yellow or blue. Or, so they chose the post-it with a white background. It turned into a transparent background. And therefore, it gives a very different look to jam. And it makes it feel like, you know, they've actually made a, a very valuable digital content which can be used by a teacher as a resource for many years to come, in fact. So that's something for you, you know, as teachers to think about how each of these apps would lend to uh, you and your classroom. So as I've been referring again and again to Google Classroom, and of course it is meant to be done tomorrow, uh, but what Google Classroom is a place where we will be using all these apps to be uh, put together in use in an organized manner and in something which you can as a teacher control. So managing the teaching learning is what happens with the Google Classroom. So just to close this discussion on what all of this would be uh, able to lead to and keep you something, you know, coming back for tomorrow before we go and uh, look at the more possibilities with uh, Google Slides and Docs. What you can do in Google Classroom is you'll be able to create classes. You'll be able to connect with students. You will distribute assignments and you will grade and send back those assignments with some feedback. And all the work that you would do here would remain in the Google Classroom for the entire academic session. 
also what you are looking at is a possibility for the students they will be able to join classroom interact with teacher attempt assignment and also access these resources get the feedback and again access all this in the classroom for the year long that's not going to change as we move along into the uh, new as we move to the cad new academic session or as they get promoted to the next class the classroom can be archived but for the teacher all the content will remain available for the years to come so all your effort that you're going to put in will only build resources for you which over the years you will be able to reuse again so more of that will come uh, in the next uh, session but we are now going to look at uh, the google slides and google docs in a little close manner just as we saw right now google uh, drawings and uh, jamboard and also to see what are the other options and how does one create so if you got interested in those drag and drop activities, then how does one create those Google uh, slides with a drag and drop? Also, if you have just a plain doc, then what else can you do with that doc, right? So for that, I'm going to uh, go to the Google Drive and that is where the action starts. So I'm going to just, uh, excuse me, I see the battery running out. I have to put this for charge. I'm just changing my position, Francis, sir. So keep the camera off. I'll just be back a minute. Right. So let's go into Google Drive now. So this is the Google Drive for me. And as you see, this is the interface which we saw earlier in the screenshot, right? And normally it is not this, it's just a trial account I'm using right now because my regular drive, it has a lot of resources and that uh, would really uh, be complicated to um, showcase. So this is how the drive looks like. Small thing which again will get highlighted. There are two folders right now. This classroom folder is not created by me. Classroom folder gets created by default every time you create a classroom as we will do tomorrow. So we will come back to this particular folder and uh, understand its structure tomorrow. Let's talk about what uh, one has here. So this is a folder that is created for resources which I'm using today and uh, otherwise uh, using for showcase. So let's start with the new button plus. So here, if I click, you will be able to see the possibilities where you have file upload, folder upload, and then the three main docs that always show up, that is Google Docs, Sheets, Slides. There is always something under the more. So if you click on more, then you will be able to find Google Forms, Drawings, My Maps, again a great tool for social science teachers. You can create your own websites through Google Sites. And of course, if you are good at coding, then you can try to create certain uh, add-ons and extensions which work if you can. Then that will come from here. And of course, Google Jamboard. My Meister is not there by default. It has been released for our domain. That is why it is showing. It won't show in every um, Google Drive. So to begin with, let's create a Google Doc. So when I start with Google Doc, it says, do you want blank or from a template? I'm going to start with blank document. You can create templates uh, on the basis of what you're going to use regularly so that uh, in case you want a certain header of the document, you can keep that ready. And each one of you in the school can use that. That is also a possibility. You can create templates for your organization. But once you open a blank document, there is pretty much nothing in it. So we first always start by naming the document. So this is going to be our first document. So I'm going to just call it number one. And uh, we are going to look at, uh, since it's a demo, so I'm just going to call it a demo. So naming of the file, why it is important is because when you are going to search for it, it is always 
good to have the name or title given. Otherwise, there will be too many untitled documents in your drive. And uh, um, it, they will all look alike. And you will not be able to figure out what is in them till you open the file. So name your file. So suppose you want to now give some work, um, maybe a research work to the students. You want them to put together some information in this document. So there are a number of things that one can do in order to give them a basic structure. You can look at insert and that is where so many other possibilities are present. You can insert an image, table, drawing, chart, etc. Right? If you want equation, so if there are some maths teachers here, uh, then you can even use for the Google Docs, you can use the equation inbuilt in the doc, but although there is a better alternative for it, but you can for Google Docs, you can start using this, not for slides or forms, but you have math equations here, special symbols as well. You have header, footer, page number, break, you can also link and so on. I'm going to start by bringing a certain structure to this. So I'm going to start with a table. So I'm going to give them some structure so that there is an easier way for them to manage what they are uh, doing. So I'm going to maybe make two columns and uh, some rows here. So in this case, if you're looking at possibly making this to be a collaborative uh, uh, resource where the students are supposed to answer questions. So why I'm saying make it collaborative because if we are expecting children to type, it is not fair that we give them because their typing speed may not be really great uh, and it is not worth as well. So you can create one document and maybe put question number one here and then the next row becomes for answer. And then comes a question number two and then the student will have a chance to answer that. So if it is a subjective question, then you can put the questions here, share this document with the class and allocate which student is going to do or answer which question. Together, they will build up the resource, which as a teacher, you will be able to view in live time. You will be able to perhaps select one answer and put a certain feedback. So if I'm looking at that coming in here, I'm looking at this comment box and I can actually so let me just type something here so I'm just writing just one word and the moment I select this word I will be able to add a comment here and I will be able to say uh, correct the spellings or uh, whatever else you want the children to be aware of so suppose they are missing a point I can put that comment here. so as the child opens up this document they will be able to see these feedback coming in or in the real time if we are doing it together then also the child and the teacher can converse with each other right here the student can then go and reply to this and uh, maybe even resolve this comment because he has followed the instructions so even if i resolve it doesn't go away i can still open this as a history and i'll be able to see as to who resolved or who had made that comment, I can reopen the comment as well. So this is something which is helpful if you are looking at in the course of time, if you are trying to get some kind of resources built up where you are sharing the work with the students, then that is definitely possible. There is also a possibility other than text. What you can have is maybe it is a question where the child needs to do a research and then support his answer by a certain image. So if they want to insert a certain image, they just have to click here where they want to insert the image, go to insert and then find the image. So they will click on image, then there are options. Do you want to upload from the computer, search the web, or we are looking at the most, uh, yeah, search the web, or is it something that is in your drive, or even Google Photos. They can even take a camera and insert. So if suppose you are asking them to do something on a piece of paper, then you may ask them to take the image of that uh, work using the camera of their own device, 
and then insert. So they can hold up the sheet in front of the camera, take the image and insert that image right in the place where the cursor is. So that is also a possibility. But right now I'm going to use the search the web and if I click on search the web, then here is where I can search the web within the environment of Google Doc, not going outside the Google Doc. So here, if I click on search the web, so what do I want to search? Obviously, based on the problem that we are talking about. So I'm going to search for maybe there are social science students and they've been asked to pick a certain or write about certain wonders of the world. So they may want to be uh, writing on uh, my favorite Taj Mahal. So if they are looking at finding the image corresponding to Taj Mahal. So here is all the images related to Taj Mahal shows up. So suppose I want to take this image and insert it, then I can just click on that image. The moment I click, there's a small blue tab that opens at the bottom and it says insert. So if I click on insert, then that image will go in the place where the cursor was. So it goes and fits very well within the structure that has been provided by the teacher. So you will create this template because you have a certain expectation that the children will answer certain questions and then support their work with some images. And that image has to come in a certain place, not anywhere else. So obviously the moment the child does that, it, the image very nicely fits in the uh, column and the row where it is meant to. Of course, the child can always uh, resize it. So they can make it smaller if they read. And then they can go about explaining. So it could be writing facts about uh, wonders of the world. So where do they go and research? So do they go and open another Google uh, tab here? Well, not really needed. What you can do with the Google Doc is there is a small plus sign right at the bottom of the screen. I cannot enlarge that much, so I hope you can see. So the moment you take your cursor to the bottom right end uh, corner, it gives you an explore. The moment I click on that explore, I will be able to see a small window panel opening up with information, right? What do I want to search? So I don't want to search within my document. I want you to search about, so I'm going to just, in, uh, sorry, click on the same and I'm going to not search within the document, but on the web. So I'm going to search for Taj Mahal. So I'm writing a report on Taj Mahal. So all the web information opens up for Taj Mahal. I can choose a particular uh, tab that uh, a link which I think will be substantial and from there the information can be then used to be uh, picked and related to. At the same time, if I uh, look at the answer coming in here, then the child, if he is using this link, then if you click on this quotes, then it will also put the citation for it. And then they can write it so it will become a good way for them to list the sources that they are using to build up their report. In fact, this image also, if I click, it will be uh, possible for me to see what source it is coming from. So that is also a possibility uh, when you are giving some work to the students and they can work within the environment of Google Doc itself. So that is uh, definitely an option. But suppose I want to uh, also do what I did earlier of inserting a Google drawing here. Some of you might find that useful, uh, especially the social science teachers, uh, science teachers, when you want them to label diagrams. What one can do here is if I click on this box and I go to insert, I can click on drawings and then I can either choose a new drawing or I can choose from drive. So if I've already kept a Google drawing ready, then I can do that or I can create a fresh drawing right here. So a plus and I got a new drawing. I can then use the tools that are available here. So I can uh, put some instructions here. So it could be label the diagram and uh, I can put a diagram 
in this place in this insert as an image so here is image icon i can find again so i can again search for the image or i have an image ready already so if i'm looking for uh, let's not forget maths so if i'm looking for a coordinator then i can find various images of the coordinator i can then choose a coordinator and i can insert that so i can label the diagram it could be label the vertices label the sides draw diagonals so i can change this to much more so suppose i uh, give them the instruction label the diagram and uh, draw diagonals so when i am looking at draw diagonals of the following coordinator then there are these tools when you save and close the, when the child opens it they'll get exactly this they will open this little tool which is for lines and arrows where we found the curve connector so they'll use the line tool and they will uh, perhaps draw the line from here to this they again since you have tools why not use them in an effective manner they can change the color and they can keep that work ready for you so this is what the student would do you would do you can give them just a coordinator and then ask them to so click on save and close and this will fit into the drawing in your your google doc you have to perhaps also give them the instruction that double click to open it so as you saw perhaps in my earlier document if you had paid no attention that this had to be very clear in terms of the instructions if you give it like this they will not they will try to put a label somewhere it won't work so you have to tell them to double click it it will open up then they will label draw the diagonals and then again click on save and close so that their work is saved and it will show here so that is one way of making even a simple google doc turn into an interactive activity with least of the effort so think about it from science um, perspective maybe you have an image already which you are always using uh, to put in the worksheets or you can just take a screenshot of that worksheet uh, which you are using insert that as an image here and ask the children to label so that is something where the child will be able to so again it is not the best way of using the uh, technology but if it is make meeting the purpose that you intended to then that is definitely the way so it is still a worksheet but you are giving it in hands of children who do not have a printer at home they are not going to print all of these worksheets we have to keep uh, this idea in mind that they are not going to print these tasks that are given to them so if we do not have that then can we make it interactive that they can answer in then and there and it gets back to you for your review and feedback so google docs definitely uh, work for that so i hope this has uh, given you some insight into the possibilities that what google doc opens for you and then again it is up to you uh, and uh, your uh, need for the subject in terms of how it uh, works for you let's uh, go back to the drive and see what we can do with slides so because slides are uh, again in fact all of these apps have lot of Uh, possibilities but slides have multiple ways of being used so let's look at where the google slides are so again click on plus and this is where google slides are we'll click and find a blank presentation so once you get the blank presentation it opens up in this uh, way and it is absolutely blank right i'm just going to change the zoom factor here so that it is not uh going out of the screen but you can still see it so this is what the slides look like again untitled is the first thing you must change so i'm going to change it to demo 2 and then you are ready to get started so what can one do in slides as we saw earlier uh, you can share this deck with your students just to keep an order in place you have to give a structure so you can give them a basic template give them a instruction what is expected of them 
and then you can uh, ask them to follow rule number wise because that is something that they relate to or you can even put their names if you have the names of the students of your class with you then you can put the name on each slide and that actually would be nice because they'll feel that you have given enough attention to that fact and they uh, definitely would be happier to work on their slides there so if i keep clicking on this plus sign, I'll be able to add slides. And each of these slides, if I keep clicking right now in this format where the earlier one was selected, it will take the same layout as the first here. I can change the layout. So I can change the layout from uh, this title and body to title only. I can change the layout to just a blank. Also, when we make slides, then it is important for us to see some more color, some more uh, design in it. Blank slides always uh, are not as appealing. So especially now when we are looking at uh, making use of technology, uh, then it is important that we use colors, we use various themes. So if I click on this theme, I get all of these inbuilt themes here. You can choose any one of these themes to get started with. So you can choose any one theme. So suppose I take this one, which is looking colorful, and I add it, then by default, it will immediately start taking the form that this particular slide follows. Or if I choose uh, this, then slides will immediately change to the format that this theme follows. So you're looking at this one coming with a blank, this is with the title and the text and so on. So it will be nice to use this option and it will save you time. There are, of course, uh, lots of websites which are creating and giving you templates. So it will be absolutely great if you could go and check out some of those websites. Uh, so you can again just uh, you know Google for something called as a slide mania. That's one of the website slides. Uh, Carnival is another a website which you should visit and choose templates for Google Slides. Those are outstanding uh, templates and very generously made available for you to use. So please go ahead and do try them out. Uh, that will save you a lot of work because the uh, aesthetic part of the slides is taken care of. You will then only focus on the content and that is something which you need to focus on. You shouldn't uh, spend your energy on the design aspect. So what else can one do with it? You've taken care of these possibilities, but now suppose I want to create something in this particular slide and I want to get maybe some image or text coming in. So again, we go to insert and I can add a text box if it was not there. And I can type in some uh, content as it is needed. I can also add an audio. So, so far, the audio that can be added in Google Slides goes with the idea that you need to have an MP4 file in your drive. So you can maybe do an audio recording. You can use your phone to do the audio recording. Save that audio recording in your G Suite for Education to be ID. And then use that recording to be inserted along with your slides. So you may be explaining a concept and there are some images coming on the slide. So it kind of becomes a video, but with the use of slides. You can also insert a video. Now this is a great option because there is a lot of video content available. And I'm a strong believer of not reinventing the wheel. So when there is something available, why not use it? So there are beautiful lessons being created by teachers like you, all available on YouTube. So if you come across a nice video which is teaching what you want to teach, then why not use that wheel? And you might be already doing that. So how are we using those videos need to be reconsidered perhaps uh, if you are just sending the link out then sometimes that link becomes brings in distraction because from one video the child moves on to the other and uh, maybe 
their content that you want them to learn was only five minutes long. But the video by itself was 15 minutes long. So how does the child then, uh, you know, see that five minutes? Do they watch everything they did, right? So what happens? We use YouTube inserted in the Google Slides. And that will help you to trim the content as well. So I'm going to just demonstrate that. So suppose I want to find a YouTube video. Best is for you to first see that video, right? But suppose I want to find a video. So I'm going to find on, uh, say, uh, factorization. So I want to find a video on factorization. And I will just put in the keywords. And I'm uh, more interested in picking a prime factorization. Uh, so this is one video or one channel that my teachers like uh, to use math and text. The explanation is very clear. The videos are short. So I'm familiar with this uh, particular kind of a channel. So otherwise, you will first watch the video before you share with the students. Don't go by the uh, name and the brief that these videos have. So let's click on that video and then I will select. So once I click on that and I select, it comes and fits in the slide. I can change the size. I can change its place. So this is a video which was showing to be almost seven minutes long. But suppose I'm not interested in uh, this to be a complete seven minutes video. I want to show only the in between two to three minutes. How does one do that? You're not going to download it. Downloading the YouTube is not legal, first of all. And you will need a software to trim. So what one can do is, I'll just click on the video. There is a little uh, option coming up as format. So format options, it will open a tab on the right side. It opens a little tab on the right side. Let's pay attention to this. And here is where I'll be able to choose the time at which the video must start and the time at which it must end. So if I play this video, then I'll be able to choose where it starts and where it stops. So suppose I don't want the introduction to come in. I don't want all of this. I want to only uh, bring in from this point. So if I have seen the video and I know that whenever the person talks about why should we doing this and something like that prompts up or I'm following the audio, I'll click on use correct time. So instead of the video starting at zero minutes, zero seconds, it's going to start at one minute, 19 seconds. And then I will let it run for some more time. So he's talking about prime factorization. He will explain what the prime factorization is. And he's done the entire factorization clue, right? So he's done one example. And then we can click on use current time. And the moment I say use current time, then that will mean that the video will end at 4 minutes 27 seconds. So doing this is going to help me to play this video starting from 1 minute 19 seconds to 4 minutes 27 seconds. It's as simple as that. Also, there are other features here. Do you want it to auto play when presenting? So that also is a possibility. There is also a possibility of mute audio. Because again, you might be using it even in a live session and you want to put your voice over it. So you can do that also. Of course, there are brilliant other tools uh, not um, today that we can demonstrate them, but since we are sharing resources here along with it, if you are a keen user of YouTube videos, then one website that you must uh, go and check is Edpuzzle. So Edpuzzle is a website which uh, their tagline is that they turn videos into lessons. So this is something that you can explore. So if you are already familiar with how to crop videos here, but what you want is perhaps to insert questions between the videos. You want children to watch the video, but you also want to see whether they are able to understand the lesson coming from. So Edpuzzle does that for you. So go ahead, try that out and see if you can help. Uh, also, uh, 
once it's done, let's take a look at it, whether this video is working as per what we wanted. So I have kept it on an autoplay, so it will automatically start off from where I want it. And it will then stop at the point where I want it. So that is something which is very, very effective. So Google Slides are not only for presentations. You can use them as a teaching aid. You can use it for content building. You can put a video in a slide and then you can share this with your students. Now, how does one share this with a student will not be through this. It can be, but not through this. You will go to file and then you can publish this file to the web. This is when you want to send a video inserted in a slide. So when you do that, publish to the web, then I can just click on publish and I will get a link from here. So if I copy this link, I can then go and test it. So if I just open another new tab, I click on this, click on here, and you will see that the slides will open up as we took our first page. The child moves on to the second slide and then the audio uh, and video starts playing. So that is the simplest way that you can share uh, content which is digital with your students. So this is something which is safe because then the children are not getting distracted and they will only see the part that you want them to focus on. You can of course make it, uh, uh, you can add more content to this or first slide, etc. That is completely up to you as to how you want to enrich the content that has been created uh, as far as this is concerned. But this is definitely something for you to try. Okay. Uh, once you have all of these ideas, I'm going to do a quick demo. That's going to be the last demo for today's session on how you might be able to create the drag and drop activities that I had showcased earlier. I hope some of you are interested in it and you are still watching the show or you will come back to see the recording and then you might be wondering how was that created. So if it is uh, something that is of interest to you, then it will take us five minutes to give you a short demo on that, right? So I'm heading back to the drive and again, starting with a fresh slide. So I'm going to create a blank presentation here. And in the blank presentation, I'm going to create these drag and drop activities by first building the background. So the background was not movable, whereas uh, the objects that were on it were moving. So there are two ways in which you can do this. One is to go into the background, as you see here, the menu available, and you can choose an image. So if you can find a suitable image that uh, works for your um, particular topic, so suppose I'm looking for an image and I'm looking for, let's take an example of uh, maps. So India map and if I want only the outline. So I can get the India map and I can have that inserted uh, into, so maybe this one is already labeled. I didn't want anything labeled. I just wanted empty uh, outline only. So if I can find something suitable, we will be able to, or you can go into the web and from there you can find it. Because sometimes here the image is restricted, image search is restricted. But if you can, then you can go into the uh, and, uh, open uh, Google and find the URL from there. And by URL also you can find the image. So if I can, otherwise we will uh, go to maybe Let's try once again. Let's see if we can find something suitable here. Uh, not really. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's not really working. Maybe we can take the world map and we can insert that. So that will come in the background of the slides that we are talking about. And then so if you have this, we don't need this now, so I can delete it. I don't need this here, I can delete it. And then we can ask the children to label the various continents. So you can do that. This becomes our background. 
you can give them some text boxes here or you can give them some shapes so you can have a, a small exercise built where a can represent if you are looking for africa and they need to then drop this uh, to on where they think the africa will be now sometimes when you use the text here it is not very clear that this is something that can be dragged so you can just put some background color so the child will know that this is something that they they will be able to uh, move around so this will become more clear than just a text that has been typed in that is one way or you can take images uh, sorry shapes and then from here take a shape put it down here and if the child has been given the questions or an exercise says label the map and there are uh, a b c d parts you can simply put a here and then the child will be uh, able to place a where the africa is supposed to be marked and so change the background if you wish to have a different color and the child will come and then they will be able to drag this image to the point where you want the child to put it so something which is you know this north america so they will come and put it here and at a glance you will also be able to see once they submit this kind of an assignment back uh, to us through the google classroom so that's one way you can actually insert a background the second could be as you saw that not always the uh, background that you want will be available so you can create your own backgrounds in slides so if i take this uh, um, slide let's uh, get rid of this one so let's add a new slide here and let's take just the blank layout so i can now create the background right here so i'm going to first color the background so i'm going to just change the background color so let's take this as our color and here i'm going to make the timeline so i have already some tools so i'm going to use the arrow tool and i'm going to draw this arrow make it a little prominent in terms of its width and so this is kind of a timeline mark that we want if you want it to be different color you can change the color as well you can increase the length if you uh, think you need more space for it come back to the line tool and choose line and then let's make some marks here for that children to uh, understand so i don't want the line end to be this i want this line end and let's change the colors as well so let's make this so once i have copy i can paste and then we'll drag them around to put them in certain points so this is the kind of a background that i have made and as i said earlier put more information because this template is something where the children are going to work and submit the work so put a text box here and explain in detail what this timeline is about what are they expected to do so anything that you don't want to move that should come right here so this is something where you will be able to maybe change the font uh, font size make it center and so on all that uh, can be done as far as the aesthetics are concerned so you can have all of that information put in place so once your background is ready which is not which you don't want to move you can again go to the file and then download this as a png file so download this entire presentation as the background and let's save this so once your background is ready we are now going to use this image to be the background so i'm going to take a new file take the layout to be blank and then we are going to start working on now i'm going to go to background i choose image so i'm going to upload now browse or drag a file here so since we have just created i'm going to just pull and put it here and it will get inserted so the movement it's done i'm going to click on done and now you can add in images so there could be images of uh, scientists or mathematicians or various objects or historical events or you can even take text box and make text boxes here with those information which is that something that we want them to move and put across and that
that will take care of uh, the way that you want students to work with. So again, how this is going to be shared? That is something which, so again, I deleted the earlier one, but the difference is in the first slide, everything is movable, right? Whereas in the second slide, since it's gone into the background, it's all fixed. Nothing is going to move. Only the objects that I put over it will be uh, so how we are going to share this kind of a template with the students and how the students will get their individual copy and how they will be able to do the work and come back to us. We will be uh, talking more about that in our uh, next uh, session that's going to be tomorrow. So if there are any uh, concerns or questions, uh, sir, if um, Francis sir can uh, give me some feedback on how we've been doing so far, if there is something that you so would think, like to elaborate on. So I think uh, since we have uh, not enabled the chat, right, yes. uh, we will not be able to take oh, questions. Yeah, I forgot that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, uh, so, but I think, uh, yeah, so I think we have covered good ground. And uh, you want to share because we many of our teachers are uh, been teaching for years together, never used technology so actively. You you have some thoughts on how did how do they actually be empowered and what they should do? Some tips for them? Absolutely, absolutely. So since it is something you know new for everyone, and we are all uh, trying to move out of our conventional mode of teaching to the current one uh, where we are all expected to you know master the technology so my uh, share would be that don't let that be the prominent factor don't lose your target your focus on uh, the pedagogy so you always keep that in forefront you first keep thinking about what you want to teach and then if you have seen various tools then you think about which tool would work best for you Rather than going with the, you know, or rather the, in fact, the, what we have showcased today, don't let that influence you or overwhelm you. Uh, so I think we've, uh, we've just got her drop. Uh, by the time Sangeeta ma'am just joins us back, I would like to just remind you of some, uh, the forthcoming second session when it is going to happen. Uh, that's going to be the next session, which is going to come up uh, on 1st of June, which is Monday, between 11.30 and 1.30 p.m. Uh, that's, uh, so that uh, would be continued by Sangeeta ma'am on Monday. Uh, post that, we would have, yeah, Sangeeta ma'am has just joined in. Yeah. I, sorry, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no problem. I thought I've lost the connection right at the last few minutes. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so as I was saying, don't let uh, the technology overwhelm you. You stay focused on what your main job is, and that is to teach students to make sure that they uh, stay connected with you. And uh, But do not hesitate to use technology as well. Start with small baby steps. Uh, take what you think is working best for you. Uh, but don't wait for you to get perfect with it. So that's my uh, mantra, as I always call it. Don't wait to perfect something before you start using it. So even if it doesn't work well, it's perfectly fine. Children are very, very understanding. They, they don't worry about it not working. In fact, they will give you tips on how to make it more uh, convenient and easy for them to understand and for you to use a certain tool. So definitely go ahead and try them out and give them uh, the power. So even if you don't know something, tell them that I think this will work very well. Go ahead and explore. Maybe make a video or take a picture and show me your work. So that also they will jump at doing all of that. So don't underestimate your students. That is something. I think uh, if, if there are students watching this show, maybe you'll be surprised that they might start using Google Classroom faster than how <laughs> we are using. Absolutely. But I think uh, children fortunately do not have the fear to use technology and that helps them to go faster than us because yeah. we have a lot of perceptions and fears with our mind to take on the tools. Uh, yes. Ma'am, what are you planning on Monday for the second session? What are you planning? Would you like to um, share? Yeah, Monday is going to be about how uh, all the apps that we have seen today, how we can use them in the environment of Google Classroom. So you have created content. It's there in your drive. 
but how do we take it to the students so that is going to be done through the google classroom so we will be focusing on what google classroom is how we create google classroom how do students join google classroom and then what kind of assignments can we create using google classroom and of course the assessment part because with teaching and learning comes assessment so we yeah. need to have an understanding of how the assessment is done again it will not be a replication we cannot in fact we should not in fact replicate the school model it's not going to be possible but in the current scenario how effectively you can do the assessment and you can give feedback to the student is what the focus will be so that we will talk about on monday and uh, when when i was watching how you were integrating everything together like uh, you integrated youtube so easily you know if you do not have a lms like uh, and uh, a power of which google classroom offers it's so difficult right you need to download illegally then you need yeah. to attach so you want to share how integration is being done in google classroom which makes life easier see google classroom doesn't do the integration but when you're sharing the content then the path through which you are sharing the content goes through the google classroom so the apps that you are, and there are many websites which are also integrated with google classroom that means you come across a good digital content like ck12 is one website or even khan academy so if you come across some content there and you want to share it with students then it can be the rosters can be integrated and you can take the path through the um, google classroom also the rights what kind of rights the file should have so instead of going through the what we saw in morning uh, in beginning if you go it through the google classroom then google classroom will let you decide what yeah. whether the child is going to view that file or going to edit that file or get a copy of that uh, as an individual file so that is uh, what we will be looking at and it's not very complicated so i want yeah. to assure the teachers it's not going to be complicated it's like facebook you know how to put post on a facebook you can post on google classroom as well and no one went for a course to use facebook right no one <laughs> absolutely to learn uh, i think yes. i just want to share about the future sessions uh, yeah. um monday we have got ma'am coming back on 1st of june between 11:30 to 1:30 uh then we have got two more shows we have got on 2nd of june we have got uh, Ms. Bani Pentel, the one who is our head of education for South Asia, Google, she'll be coming and having an interaction uh, about many of those questions which are in your mind. Uh, followed by which, uh, on Thursday, we would be also interacting with Vipul Reddy, uh, the head of school enabling from Khan Academy. The whole objective is to see how we can uh, have multiple the perspectives be heard. because we are finally taking on platforms and we have to talk with our parents our students so we want lot of these people to talk to you for for you to get strength right we believe in it and we want to have a common belief in all our schools among all the stakeholders of the school so that's the objective and uh, that's how we have planned uh, so i think ma'am thank you so much uh, we are exactly at 6 and i'm very thankful to all the teachers almost We have managed to retain 2,700 uh, teachers till now, from around 3,800. So thank you to all those teachers who waited till the last minute. Thank you, and see you on Monday again at uh, 11:30 a.m. at the same page. Thank you, ma'am, right. and thank right. you to all the participants. Bye, bye, ma'am. Bye, bye.